going to read because this is a letter I wrote to Zaida and I want to share it. And I wrote it in English. Dear Zaida, over a month has passed since you left us and the gaping hole in our lives has gotten no smaller. You filled our lives. You filled them practically, you filled them emotionally, and you filled them spiritually. Practically, you filled them in an everyday sense. You were ever present. Every evening on your way home from work, you would come over before we went to bed. Bathed and in pyjamas, we would sit at the bottom of the staircase in eager anticipation. You would stand by the front door, suited, hatted, briefcase in hand, a classic English gentleman. You'd doff your hat and you'd dance, a tap dance, to a tune you composed yourself but claimed was a chassid shenigan. On other evenings, we'd play lions and tigers. You would crawl among us, roaring, and we'd jump on your back. As we grew, the center of interaction gravitated towards your home. Every Sunday and Wednesday, we'd join you for grandma's delicious supper. Not a Shabbos passed in which we weren't together for at least a meal. Every Friday, all the grandsons would gather around your study desk for Chumash Rashi Shir before jumping into the car and speeding through Golders Green to get to Rebchunas a few seconds before Shkir. And the walks, so many walks, through Hampstead Heath and Kenwood, the English countryside around Brentridge and the Alps. We talked Torah, business, academic studies, anything that was on our minds. You would often say that you could tell where one's mind was holding by where one's thoughts wandered to on a walk. And on the walks, the memoirs, recollections, and stories poured forth. Stories from your youth and escape from Europe, stories from your involvement and building of institutions, your interactions with great people. They entertained, they informed, and they inspired. You had your favorites, which you repeated so many times that we could tell them over verbatim ourselves, yet we never tired of hearing them. The walks were your recharge in the middle of the day, your exercise, your breath of fresh air, and if you could do that with a grandchild, that was pure joy. There were many reasons we loved spending time with you, but perhaps the strongest was that you loved spending time with us. You did not tell us so. You didn't have to. We knew it. Emotionally, you are a rock of support. We could discuss with you anything that was on our mind, personal and otherwise. Usually, though, we didn't even need to. You knew it already. You cared so deeply. When you gave advice, it was invariably wise. And when you didn't, we knew that our issues were at the forefront of your mind, and that itself gave us enormous strength. You wore your heart on your sleeve, and you loved to think aloud. So we always knew what was occupying you. How many times did a conversation wander to your concern for a grandchild? And what were the potential solutions? What could you do to help? Spiritually, you are our role model. What a privilege it was to have grown up and have been brought up by such an outstanding exemplar of Torah and Derech Eretz. You devoted so much of your life to Talmud Torah. After your family, it was your greatest passion and joy, and you truly excelled in it. You made a mockery of the term balabos. Your learning was far superior than that of the vast majority of learning professionals. In any shir you would attend, and you used to bring me along to a few, your questions were the sharpest, your comments the most insightful. The audience knew it, the Magad Shir knew it, and I knew it, and I was so proud. You would love to ask anyone you happened to be talking to what they were currently learning, and you would hold your own in discussing sugyas you hadn't seen in years. You were never interested in the cover that came with the reputation that preceded you. You often downplayed your kishroness. When I was in Vienna a few weeks ago for Pesach, Someone in shul related to me that you had once told his father, in your typically witty and unassuming manner, twice in my life I was a greater Talmud Chochum than a Gvir. And that was in reference to the worldwide recessions in 1973 and 1990, where your net worth was at zero. <laughs> Throughout your life, you were fully engaged with the world in the most profound way, and Torah values permeated every aspect of that engagement. At your 90th birthday celebration, you shared with your London contingent of the family some values you wanted the family to be defined by. You distinguished yourself 
from those who felt, who you felt, compartmentalize Yiddishkeit to davening with a minion and daily chavrusas. To be a religious Jew, you insisted, meant living like a Jew every moment of the day. This, far, when this went far beyond halacha and tariag, but that was the basis. Without ever buying into the Khumra frenzy, and without imposing it on others, you were scrupulous in your Torah, in your Shmir's Torah mitzvahs. Not the showy parts, but the basics. You davened and benched with real kavana. You took your mimtoivim seriously. You rarely missed a minion, though at times you wondered whether they overrode other values such as family dinner. You were punctilious about zmani tefillah, despite having no concept whatsoever of punctuality. <laughs> and if a halachic doubt arose, you didn't hesitate to ask her of. You were a proud Jew in the workplace. At business lunches, you always ordered kosher meals, despite the awkwardness. And you came up with an unwrapping system so it wouldn't cause too much of a commotion. It goes without saying that in all monetary affairs, you were straight as an arrow. You went above and beyond to ensure that everything was 100% kosher. You instinctively ran a mile from anything which even hinted at structures or anything offshore. Even the way you looked after yourself physically bore an unmistakable Torah value imprint. From a young age, you took great care to maintain a healthy lifestyle. As with so much else, here too, you are way ahead of your time. Long before physical exercise became fashionable, you would regularly jog, swim, and cycle. Of course, you enjoyed all these activities, but you were fully conscious and expressed it often that these were all means to an end. If you felt that any of us were either spending too much time on sport or taking it too seriously, you didn't hesitate to tell us. At one point, bothered by the time you were spending staying fit, you went to express your concern to the Amshan of a Rebbe. You would tell us, only half in jest, the Rebbe's response. One doesn't need to be such a perfectionist. You like to quote the Medrash in Bereshis Rabba, which criticizes B'nai God and B'nai Reuven, Sha'osu esa ikka tofel vesa tofel ikka, in critique of those who made a big deal or ends out of means, such as holiday, food, sport, and clothes. Every summer and winter, you holidayed at the same place in the Alps, which provided you with all you needed from your break. You were never tempted to visit exotic locations or experience foreign cultures. That, for you, was already making an ikka out of a toffle. When we recounted to you from our travels around the world, you always responded that you had been over 100 times to the same place in the Swiss Alps, and on your next holiday, you wanted to go nowhere else. For all that which you deemed toffel, you were in many ways a creature of habit. You ate the same breakfast every single day. You took tuna sandwiches to work for 40 years. Your creative energies and originality, which were vast, you saved for the icker things in life. This sense of purpose and originality, combined with your positivity, enthusiasm, hands-on approach, and energy, yielded an astonishing output of accomplishments. At the Shiva, several people asked me, in light of all you achieved in your lifetime, if you were one of those people who required only a few hours sleep. The truth is, you need no less sleep than the average person. And in your later years, you even napped in the afternoon. Furthermore, for a big achiever, you were remarkably unhurried. Time flowed languidly for you, dictated very much by your own pace. You never seemed to be rushing from one appointment to another, and you were always unfailingly late. You never understood the meaning of punctuality. You would even bemoan the inconsideration of people who came on time. Yet, time for you was so precious. Hours may have flowed one into the other, but every single one was filled with the strongest sense of duty, mission, and purpose. You were never rushing, but you were always doing. Leisure did not feature in your vocabulary. There was no such thing as free time. You were never idle. To your grandchildren, you would half-jokingly quip that we should take great care not to chill too much, else we may very well catch a cold. <laughs> your list of achievements is all the more impressive, considering that first and foremost, you were a family man. Family always came first. This was not just a qualitative truth, but a quantitative one too. Considering just the hours you spent learning with your, great, with your children and grandchildren, it is amazing you were able to achieve anything else at all. Achavrusas were a journey, a journey spanning thousands of hours, 
hundreds of dapping, and countless hours of priceless sikhas chulin. It started as soon as I could read Hebrew, first with Chumish, then Mishnayis, but it really got going when I started learning Gemara. From your experience teaching in the yeshiva stream in Hasmonean, you had little faith in Gemara's, in school Gemara Rabbeim. So you took it upon yourself to teach me the basics. First, how to break down Shakla Vitaria, to know what the Gemara is attempting at each step, to differentiate between question, answer, statement, and proof. Then came the classic Zayda Gemoraisms. Can you explain it to the milkman? <laughs> Rashi himself had Rashi. There is no such thing as Gomorrah sense. You would often call Grandma into the study and ask me to explain the Gomorrah to her. If Grandma didn't understand, that meant I didn't understand it properly myself. After a few years of learning together, you would, at intervals, stop reading the Gomorrah and tell me to work out the next bit by myself. You'd pick up another safer. Sometimes you would leave the room. You were patient. You would tell me there was no rush that you were confident I would figure it out. One time, I was reading, and you let me carry on for longer than usual without commenting. You then asked me if I had already learned this Gemara before. You never, hesitated to you never hesitated to compliment your grandchildren, but this was the greatest compliment of all. In the early days, you had to chase us to learn with you. But by our mid-teens, we began to appreciate the privilege of Achavrusus, and it was us who did the initiating and this gave you enormous pleasure. You would take out your little black diary from your jacket breast pocket and pencil in our chavrusa. No matter how busy you were, you always made time to learn with us. This was top priority, and you cleared your schedule if you had to. During our yeshiva years, not a phone conversation passed in which we didn't discuss what we were currently learning. You kept us on our toes, no bluffing, no waffling, only clarity and precision would do. You came to learn with us in yeshiva. At first, you expressed loudly enough, for everyone around to hear, of course, your be bewilderment as to why everything in our yeshiva had to look different. The base medrash, the chairs, the bocherim, even the rosh yeshiva themselves. But ever the ish emes, where there was truth to be found, you were forever open to new ideas and alternate paths. And the gush quickly grew in you. When I came back from yeshiva to study in England, you were initially bemused by what you called brisk taken to gush extremes. <laughs> you would invoke the Litvak mocking cliches you had picked up during your time spent in, yeshiva, in Hasidic yeshivas and poke fun at what you viewed as a lazy modern way of learning. You would sit back in your chair, pretend to smoke a pipe, and blow imaginary puffs of smoke into the air as you offered svaris. I could do this all day, you would say. I would never even need to open a Gemara. Soon, however, our methodologies met somewhere in the middle, and thereon began our most productive Chavrusi years. You were still at the peak of your intellectual powers, and having completed several years in Yeshiva, I was finally able to learn with you. When it came to Gemara, you were never a good listener. You always had to work it out for yourself. But on the odd occasion, after I had suggested an explanation, you would sit silently for a while. You would think it through, make sure that it worked, that it made real sense, not Gomorrah sense. And then you would slowly say, yes, that's good. And then you would think about it again. And then you would tell my suggestion over back to me, because your verbalizing it was the ultimate listen litmus test for truth. And then you would repeat, yes, that's good. <laughs> when we were done learning, though sometimes it couldn't wait until then, you would call Grandma to the study, and you would tell her proudly, you know, Hanla, Jonasen ben Yomen is very good, you know. <laughs> Almost every time you introduce me, you would add, and he's a Talmud Chochem. And this was especially true when I had long hair, and you wanted to quickly dispel what you assume must be people's initial misconceptions. <laughs> During my year in Kailo, we learned night seder together, first at Diskin, then at Mishmaram. Though your love and passion for learning was undiminished, by then your, th your speed of thought was no longer what it used to be. At first, I struggled to come to terms with your slowing down. I refused to believe that you needed more time than me to work it out. In my subconscious unwillingness to accept your aging, I preferred to believe that you were just being stubborn. 
and at times I became impatient. I never apologized for these occasions, and so I'm doing that now. Gradually I came to terms with it, and we continued to learn together at our new adjusted pace. Instead of learning our Masechta, we learn whatever you were learning in the Kaidal. During the lockdowns, we continued to learn two or three times a week on Zoom. Grandma or Roger would log in, and we would learn just as though we were sitting across the table from one another. In the last year or so, when it became more difficult to find time to learn together in the afternoon, I would join your Chavrusa with Rezev at the Kailul. You loved learning in your Kailul. And learning with your grandchildren there gave you so much pleasure. At my Simashas last summer, you sat at the front, quietly shepping Nachas. You didn't make a song and dance of it. Yours was a relaxed, contented, almost expectant pride. You started me on the path some 30 years ago and were alongside me the entire way. Rewind those 30 years. I'm a small blue-eyed toddler with curly white air hair. You come over to pick me up for one of your uh, walks around Hydeville Gardens and on the walls of Windsor Court. A neighbor compliments you on the lovely baby you are walking with, to which, you, to which you reply, this is not a baby, this is my friend. In your final few months, I'll come over and pick you up in your wheelchair, and we'd walk up and down Mishmaram. Nobody did compliment me on the lovely grandfather I was walking with, but had they done so, I would have told them, that's not just my grandfather, that's my friend. My best friend. <laughs>